Hey everyone, and welcome to Motion Mondays right here on Adobe Live, where we're talking Adobe After Effects and Premiere workflows all day long, right here. So stick around. Today, um, thanks so much for being a part of the Adobe community, just for being here now. Uh, I do see some people in the chat. Hello, Robert, Jack, Umicorn, as always. Uh, thank you so much for everyone that's joining in. Please be sure to subscribe over on YouTube as well as Instagram at Adobe Live. Uh, my name is Alex Hogue. I am an adventure filmmaker out here in Bend, Oregon, running a small studio, and I'm going to be your host for this session. And I'm joined by Patrick Lawrence. Patrick, how you doing? Hello. How are you doing today? Doing great. So happy to have you here. And I'm really excited to talk about this topic. And for those of you who don't know, Patrick is a professional film editor based in LA. Uh, he's done a bunch of feature films, uh, at least 16 from what I was hearing, uh, a <laughs> handful of which have premiered at Sundance, which is pretty cool. Can't wait to ask tons of questions about that. And uh, he also does some television work. Uh, he is the lead editor for season one and season two of Bonding, which you might have seen on Netflix. So today we are talking the art of feature filmmaking. So if you have any questions about making some long form story narrative driven content, this is the place to enter them into that chat. So really excited to jump into it. And uh, Patrick, I would love to just hear from you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us your background and what's your day to day work like? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I got started. Uh, I, I had a, uh, in my twenties, I played music and, uh, spent a lot of time in a band. And so when I was itching to get into filmmaking, which was originally what I wanted to do out of high school, I knew that I had a, a lot of connections in the music community. So I started out making music videos and doing a lot of my own directing and teaching myself to edit. And, uh, eventually that got me into working with film crews and I put myself out there as an editor first and foremost. Uh, and it allowed me to kind of work my way up. And, and, you know, I was just thinking this morning, you know, it's, it's 2024 now. I didn't even realize that it's been 10 years since I edited my first feature film. And, uh, so in those 10 years, I've edited about 18 features uh, most of which have been cut in Premiere Pro. And uh, from time to time, I get asked by fellow editors, like, how does Premiere handle editing feature films? And I kind of laugh about it because I've never really had an issue. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of times, you know, when you're taking on a project, there's usually either some type of decision that's made by production or by the director uh as to whether or not you know oh it needs to be cut in whichever platform and so it's good to be flexible and uh know as many editing platforms as possible just so that way like you yourself as an editor can be flexible and versatile but uh i just find the sort of stigma that is like you know i, I it's sort of how do you use Premiere Pro in a feature film setting? And uh, and so I wanted to kind of like go through that today and explain like how I do it. And uh, I also want to uh, put up a bit of a warning that like every editor is completely different. And what's important is that you do the things that make you comfortable. So what I'm going to show you today might not necessarily be like what works for you or what works for other editors, but they're the things that work for me. And I'm definitely the type of editor that I like to get in and get out. I like to spend the least amount of time editing in my day as I can. And Premiere Pro is that uh, actually the entire Creative Cloud suite is it gives me the ability to do that. And especially with some of the advancements that have come over the last year with like text-based editing and Lumetri color panel and essential sound panel. And all of those things have really upped my game even more just in the last 12 months. 
uh, and it allows me to do some of my best work in the quickest amount of time, which is what I love. So excellent. Yeah, no, that's uh, that actually covered my next few questions of like, how did you get in? <laughs> so you you kind of transferred from music into editing, which is awesome to hear. And then uh, you're based down in L.A. Have you always been operating out of L.A.? Were you always on that L.A. grind? No, I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri, and the grind there is completely different because there's not as much film centric work that comes through. We were lucky for a while and we had some like reality TV shows that were shooting. And um, when I worked there, when I was just getting started, you know, you would basically be jumping from project to project, you know, from, you know, you would do a music video to a short film, to a commercial, to, you know, some sort of, you know, political ad to a feature film, like sometimes just like week to week. And so you just had to be, super versatile and i and i think that that has stayed with me this entire time because even like right now was this last year we're going through the strikes there's been not a lot of work to go around for everybody so being versatile has really saved me uh in times like this and in times like during the pandemic where you know maybe there's not a lot of feature films to work on but you know you can find some commercial work or you can find some type of like promo work or you know, uh, music videos or short films, you know, so it, it, it helps. Awesome. Well, um, it sounds like we're going to, we got a lot to cover. We're going to kind of touch on your entire workflow and I'm going to be asking questions along the way. Anyone in the chat, um, Rob, Jack, uh, everyone just please throw in your questions. We have a great opportunity here to hang out with Patrick. And with that, Patrick, I'm going to let you go ahead and kind of jump in. Um, I'm assuming we're going to just kind of start with how you lay things out. Yeah. Yeah. I think a big part of your edit is organization. There's been so many times I've been called into whether doctor film or, you know, uh, do some sort of cleanup work where it just, just files everywhere. And so organization is super important. And so one of the and things you, that I like to do, Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Do you do that organization inside of premiere or do you do it prior? So it's a little bit of, it a little bit of both. And so that's what okay. I'm going to show. Um, the first thing that, you know, at your root level on your drive, wherever you're holding the footage, uh, it's important to keep that stuff organized. And I try to keep things mirrored as possible. So I'm going to show you real, real quick. And we do In have my... a quick question from CJ. Oh. How do you go about finding your work? Like, do you oh, have wow. an agent? <laughs> that's a... Uh... That's that's a uh, that's that's deep. Um, I I do have an agency. I'm represented by IAG, and um, you know it's it, it's definitely a lot of networking because even even with having agents, there's no guarantee to actually get any work. So a lot of it is who you know and meeting people, and so the network game, <laughs> the net yeah the network game, n meeting directors, meeting producers especially. Because a lot of times directors themselves, they might only get a project off the ground every couple of years. But if you can get in good with some producers, those producers might be making two to three projects a year or more. And uh, or they might be able to refer uh, refer you to other people. Um, so that's really where good connections are made. And then, you know, meeting other editors, obviously. And, you know, if if in times where the work is more fruitful, and like, there's a lot to go around. Like, it's good to be friends with other editors because if they can't do something, they might be able to throw it your way. Awesome, love that. So let's go ahead and dive into Premiere, and I'll let you get back into your uh, your organization methods here. Yeah, absolutely. So first, you know, starting out at your drive level, wherever you're keeping the footage, uh, it's really important to keep things organized. And so I do this sort of numerical structure, where I have uh and, and that's just sort of an organization so you know if you go to like uh change by name it'll keep things in order kind of in a hierarchy and so my structure is usually like zero being final deliverables that's going to be the last place it's empty for the most part but then that's going to be the last place that like when the film is done and our exports are all set and ready to go they go in there so that way when the film's archived or, you know, if it's a year later and you have to go get something, you know exactly where it is. It's right there. Um, and then from there, I do footage, audio, project, assets, exports, 
reports, and then turnover files. And to give you a little bit more explanation there, footage and audio is pretty self-explanatory. Project files are where the, the, the project folder is where the project files go. Assets are kind of anything that comes in, whether it's like vis temp visual effects, sound effects, temp music, stock footage, ADR, graphics, anything like that that is sort of in addition to my source media is what I put in my assets. Exports, Excellent. kind of self-explanatory. <laughs> and then reports, usually if you're working with uh, good productions and good scripties, script supervisors, um, they give you a ton of notes and camera reports sometimes i have my script file in here um anything that's basically like documents in addition to the film i keep in my reports folder and then turnovers is where i send uh files that are going to color and sound and we're going to get into that a little later excellent so, well, I'm, I'm going to let you go ahead and continue diving on this, but there is a quick question coming yeah. in uh, and maybe we'll get into this a little bit uh, into the stream. I'm not sure. I just wanted to make sure to cover mm -hmm. it. Uh, how do you edit the rhythm of a film? Do you view it as uh, other editors who translate it from music or do you have a distinct perspective that suits you better? So how do you edit? The yeah, rhythm that, that's a, a good question. You know, for me, um, because I have a musical background, as I've been a drummer since I was 12 years old, um, I have sort of an inherent sense of timing. Not everybody does, but I think that like what I discovered very early on with editing was that you're, every movie you've ever seen, right, is sort of in your head. And you've seen all these techniques over time. And so once you start playing with footage, you start thinking about these things like, oh, I've seen that before. Like, what if I do this? Or these like techniques that have been established for so long that you once you start playing with it and you figure out how to do it, then it sort of becomes part of your workflow and it becomes part of your tool set, I guess. Um, so for me, it was kind of coupled with that, all the knowledge of all the movies I've seen over time, and then also my my sense of timing and rhythm from playing drums and like those were the things that worked really well for me and even now you know i, I work on projects and i'll cut i'll cut a film completely dry i don't need the music because i can hear the music in my head and of course that doesn't go for the director the director <laughs> doesn't realize that but like uh you know so you'd say like music kind of brings in that natural ability to like know where to cut and feel things out like how I it think feels. so yeah it's sort of Excellent. you know you can kind of feel feel the rhythm out even if there's nothing there and then of course you know there's there's these little happy accidents that happen when you do drop in music and then all of a sudden it's like if you have like a four four time on a track mm -hmm. and then you drop it in and you haven't touched a thing in the edit and like magically the cuts just line up that yeah. That's so satisfying. Um, <laughs> Excellent. I'll yeah. let you go ahead and continue here. Um, I'm curious for anyone else in the chat, who else uh, kind of started out or maybe does music as well as editing? And what's that like for you? Let us know. So, yeah. Right, so Patrick, so yeah, we, so I, uh, we see your organization. Now you're going to bring it into Premiere. Yeah. So I, I carry over my folder structure in the same way uh, as I do here, but I do this inside of Premiere now. So what I do is I typically make a bunch of bins. So I call the first the first level is cuts, where I would have my uh, where I have my final deliverables. So my cuts would go there, and I keep that organized usually by maybe like an assembly cut. Let me end this, uh, and then maybe I'll do a. You know, it might be an editor's cut or it might be a rough cut. Um, this should be one. And then this one, I usually label this. Oop. And you're kind of like me, it looks like, where you kind of use the numbers to help make it sequential, like always in exactly. the same order, regardless of whether it's alphabetical or not. I like Exactly, that. yes. And we'll do like a director cut. And then typically after a director cut, we do a fine cut or like a producer cut. And then uh, if I'm lucky, then after that, it's a locked cut. 
And then sometimes that locked cut would become like soft lock. <laughs> and, and how uh, would you uh, define like an assembly cut? So, so I think I call that like a paper cut. Like what's that look like? Yeah. Or like a first cut, you know, um, I, I consider my assembly cuts to be very polished in a sense to where it's basically an editor's cut. But a lot of times like assembly cuts can just be like just clips thrown in, in like the order you think they're going to go. Or sometimes they're just like, Oh, here's, here's like uh, all the circle takes from one scene all thrown together. They can be a mix of things, but if I'm typically, my secret is, is that if I'm feeling really good about my editor's cut, I call it the editor's cut. If I'm feeling bad about my editor's <laughs> cut, I call it an assembly. Oh, <laughs> secret's out. I like yeah, that. it's a like little, that. little bit of a gray area there because some, because I think that like people sort of understand that assemblies are a bit more rough. So if it just, in, where I, where I'm feeling at in my own confidence of the editor's cut is sort of like how I label that. But if I'm I feeling really that. good about it, I would call that bin an editor's cut. Final and, cut, uh, done, right away. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're good. You'll love it. Um, so uh, I start with that. And then same thing as I'm building my uh, project, I've got footage and then sound. And then I might do, uh, I'll do a scenes bin typically and where I'll keep all the scenes separate. And then I'll usually break it out and do like a sound effects bin so I can keep all my sound effects organized and then do like a music bin. And then let's see, we'll do like a 06. We'll call this like ADR and VO. Separate that. Yeah, I'm and a big then, fan of the organization. And as you're kind of going through this, uh, don't let me stop you. Yeah. We do have a, another question coming in from YouTube. Uh, since we talked a little bit about music being kind of a great skill to have that carries over into video editing, in your experience, do you think there's other just kind of life skills that carry over into video editing? Uh, yes. Or like any other, any other like bang for your buck sort of thing is the wording used here. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to, let me do, let me organize this folders real quick. So I have them ready to go. I'm going to call this one asset. Oh, I screwed that up. <laughs> uh, assets. And then, and then the last one, cause I want to touch on this is going to be AE work. Okay. Um, yeah. Life skills. So editing is not a strictly a technical job. Uh, yeah, you know, depending on what form you're working in, you might be doing video editing, you might be doing film editing, you know, you could be doing editing for YouTube or commercial work. It, it, and you have to be, you have to understand the basics of the technical side of it, which I am arguably not the best at. Um, but uh, you also have to understand story and story structure and character and understanding how characters motivations work and you have to understand emotions on a very human level and then on top of all that once you once you understand you know how a film is made and how story works and how characters work and how emotions work then you also have to deal with the psychological side of it too which they don't mm -hmm. teach you in school they don't teach you how to deal with a director when they're sitting behind you on the couch and how to deal with their insecurities and their ego and all of those things. And so you, you have to be very technically proficient and then you have to understand film on a very, you know, you know, deep level. And then at the same time, you have to have social skills in a way where you can listen and then adapt and know how to solve problems and give the directors what they want, the producers as well. Um, all of those things. It's it's um, it's more than just like showing up for a day at work and then going home at the end of the day, like you know, doing your eight hours yeah. and then going home at the end of the day. It's so much deeper than that. And um, you know, I, I, I always joke. That. Yeah, I, I, I joke because I I never was really one who loved puzzles as a kid. But like a big part of of editing is understanding like here's here's a box full of puzzles with like missing and broken pieces. 
now make something out of this. <laughs> That's so true. It's so uh, spot on. Yeah. yeah so I you're like, that. okay, all right, I can do that. But then at the same time, you've got somebody behind you telling telling you, hey, that piece doesn't go there. That piece should go over there. Or like that piece doesn't fit, but can you make it fit? <laughs> you know? So Yeah. And sometimes you got to do things, you know, the director wants something a little different than you and just how to navigate that yeah. and those emotions as well. I, I love that you touched on that. So yeah. I know we got a lot to cover and we've had a ton of questions coming in, which is <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to let you kind of go ahead and uh, dive more into the workflow and layout here. So because I know we're uh, quickly plowing through time. Yeah, but, uh, we're people are loving this. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. So now that I've got my project built, um, I wanted to make a really good point is that, uh, you know, I am been very blessed over the last couple of years and I uh, have a very great assistant named Kyle Boberg who has helped me out uh, over the last couple projects. And uh, the workflow that we like to do together is we have an AE bin and you also see this a lot in television as well, where work that Kyle does you know, or any sort of like syncing bins or anything, we'll go into this folder that kind of keeps it separate from the work that I'm doing. And then we've also started using team projects as well, which I'm not going to go into today, but we have utilized uh, team projects within Premiere. So that way we can both be working inside of a project at the same time. And, you know, he could be syncing and organizing it while I'm already cutting a scene or, right. um, or it just general other work. If I have him going and doing sound effects stuff after I've done a pass on something. So it's been super helpful and really great. But uh, so the next thing is once you've got the project built, you want to start bringing in your media. And this is where I want to make sure I don't screw it up. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> there it's okay. are We're only live. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when you're, uh... oh, I'm getting a spinning wheel all of a sudden. Um, okay. The type of work that in feature films, uh, occasionally, or most of the time, I should say, you're working with a DIT who's on set and they might prep the footage for you in advance. So you might get footage that's already synced and you might get footage that's already colored. And, uh, that's great. I love that. Uh, so I'm going to bring in a folder of that just so that we have it but uh so in here i've got this this transcoded media folder it's everything that i'm about to show but it's already made for me which is awesome so i'm going to import that folder and it comes up here so i'm just going to call this uh day oh one and we're going to call it proxies or whatever just so i know uh, and so in this case, this footage has already been synced. It's already been uh, colored and it's great. Awesome. I can basically go ahead and start organizing this footage. And uh, other times though, you might not have that ability. So we're gonna, so we're gonna actually do this the hard way and we're going to bring <laughs> Uh, footage into Premiere and we're going to sync it and uh, okay. put uh, color on it and all that stuff. So we're going to forego the easy route. <laughs> awesome. We get, so, get to see how it really works. <laughs> yeah. So what I would do is I would bring in um, all of my footage and all of my sound as well. And I do that for two reasons. One is, you know, I want to keep all this stuff let me see if I do this. I'm just going to bring all these in real quick and hopefully it doesn't go nuts. But I'm bringing all these folders, these sound folders, and they're important because not only am I going to sync them up, but then like later on in the process when I'm cutting and like we need an alt read on something or, you know, I need to find the source audio from something. Mm -hmm. It's good to just sort of have it on standby. So I love having them organized. And then I also, once it comes up here, so in this case, I've got them all grouped by date, but I could also go in and say, okay, this is actually day two. This one's actually day three. This one's day four. Right. So I, so I can do all that and keep it all, keep it all separate. So 
with the footage, I would do the same thing and I would bring them in. Um, and so let me make sure I got it. So when I bring them in, I bring them in raw. Let me make sure this is still raw. <laughs> and for uh, those of you watching, if you missed the beginning, uh, we are hanging out here with Patrick, who is a feature film editor. Uh, he's been at Sundance. He has stuff on Netflix, does all kinds of things. Um, and this will be archived so you can pause, rewind, replay if you want to follow along with any of these bin structures or anything like that. So where are we at, Patrick? So what we're going to do is I'm just going to show you, I'm going to toggle it off and on instead of just doing it from scratch. But basically I would bring in all my raw footage and this is all raw and I'm playing it at full. Um, it actually, my system seems to be handling it pretty well. I'm using a uh, Mac Studio M1 Ultra. So oh. it's, it's handling the playback pretty good. Uh, now, let's say it doesn't, <laughs> let's say, yeah. That which is the case for a lot of people yeah so you can obviously you can you know lower the quality a little bit half half is usually really good fourth or an eighth usually gets really pixelated but like half's usually a good one where it like maintains the quality pretty well and like will help but in which case if you can't do that you have to make some proxies so uh if we're gonna make proxies real quick so i have all my footage in and I would select the files that I want to create and then go to proxy, create proxies. And then you have your option format is H.264 QuickTime. I prefer QuickTime ProRes. And then I don't mind just doing just low resolution, but you might, you know, if you if your system is a little faster or maybe you've got some producers who are a little bit more nitpicky about the quality, you might consider mm -hmm. doing like more of a medium resolution. But in this case, you know, we could just do low resolution. And, and the, uh, for, for anyone wondering, basically the two options are the QuickTime and the H.264. H.264 will be a smaller file, but it's not the best um, still for playback. Uh, so that's kind of where the QuickTime ProRes really works as a great intermediate for it for nonlinear editing. Uh, it will be a bigger file, but should play nice and smooth. Yeah. Um, so then you have the option of putting the footage uh, in the original media folder. Uh, in a proxy folder or somewhere else. Now, I would usually do the first option, but the hard drive that I'm pulling from is maxed out. So I actually have this going to a separate folder. So this is a bad example, but um, otherwise, you know, putting it next to the original media folder in the into a proxy folder is great and it keeps it very organized. So uh, for the sake of time, let's imagine that I hit okay and it would go over to Actually, maybe I could. I just go ahead and hit it. I'll show, show you. It, it's going to go over to uh, Media Composer, and then it'll all go into Media Composer and start doing its ingest over there. And then once it's done, I've done this now for all of the footage, all my day one footage here. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got all this stuff is already linked up. And then you want to bring in your toggle proxy button onto your monitors, which you can get by hitting the plus button. And then it usually shows up in here. And then you take it and then you drag it onto your timeline here. I already have it there, so it's there. Perfect. So yeah, then once thanks you... for explaining that part too. It's <laughs> yeah. Important little step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that is uh let me get rid of this real quick. So at this point, you kind of select all your footage, bring it into encoder, let it do its thing pretty straightforward, and then it automatically yeah. reconnects it throw up your proxy button. And now you can work with the proxies instead. Yeah. So if I toggle proxy, it's going to come on and it might be hard to see on the YouTube, uh, but uh, the quality changes just slightly. So it goes from sharp to just a little bit more pixelated. And that's a good indication that it's turned on. But now I've got all these proxies on and it should run just a little bit smoother now. And uh, it was already running smooth, by the way. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so now I've got all my uh, proxies in line and uh, everything ready to go. And I would just do this 
for everything for all of my days of footage which in the case of this film is actually more like 15 or 20 days of footage so these are like all of my days right here this is kind of and then i have like a pickups folder and then i have the same thing for the audio actually that's a bad example i have all the audio yeah. is in here you know um so that would be what it would look like full and then uh the next step would be getting the color figured out did you have a question oh no 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 i'm just admiring if anyone in the chat um is following along and has questions though on this proxy workflow or any of that sort of stuff that patrick's talking about let us know um but no so far i think you've been very thorough it makes yeah, sense so, to me so this um this footage uh there it is this is the way it should have come in raw i had already applied lumetri to it just so that way i had it um but if it, it should come in raw so it should look like this so then the key would be you want to set your look so for this one, this footage was shot in Airy. So I bring in a, if I go up to basic correction here, uh, bring in a Airy Log C Rec 709 LUT here. Okay, and it brings the colors out a little bit more. And mm -hmm. then I have to go in and make a few just little adjustments, but these things will carry on in your clips. So that right. way, you know, you can make adjustments as you go, but you just kind of come up with like a basic look for it um, and then get that set. And then once you've got it, I copy that color and then I apply it to all of the clips. Just to give it a little bit more contrast and exactly, some, color, yeah. some life, some life to the, uh, the flat neutral yeah. stuff. So I, so I apply that onto it and then uh, give you another example here. It comes up, then it's like, then the color is already on and I'm good to go. And then same thing for the B cam footage. This is all the work that goes into editing that um, people don't necessarily see, you know, just making the <laughs> proxies and getting to the point where you can actually edit. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sorry, this is dragging for a second here. Oh, it's all right. Also, uh, if anyone in the chat is watching and you would like to be a guest on Adobe Live, uh, there is a recommendation tab on Behance up in the upper right-hand corner of the chat. Guest recommendations. Go ahead and drop any recommendations in there for someone you know or yourself. Also, our moderators will be sure to put that link in the chat as well. Yeah, so now... Um now, once I've got my proxies in and I've got color on it, uh, I want to do some syncing. So again, like I mentioned, like sometimes uh, you might get a you might get footage in advance that already is synced up, and that's great. So we I'll have bring an assistant uh, editor Kyle. We have an assistant out. editor. Shout out to Kyle. Um, so you might bring that footage in and drop it on a timeline. And that audio is already synced up. Let me find one that's got like good, uh, good number of tracks. I think, yeah. So like this one's got like four tracks of audio on it. So you might just just drag those in and start cutting, or you want to rename them. And we're gonna get in that here in a second. Um, and what is this footage we're looking at? What's this from? This is actually from a feature that I cut this fall. Uh, so it was good. I had a, I had a project already sort of like uh, built for it, so it was easier for me to explain. Awesome! Uh, but this yeah, is this is, this is a fun. Uh, this is like this is a uh, kind of a slapstick comedy that I did. Um, so uh, what I would do now is create a synced folder and. I might call it like sync or I might call it like day one sync or whatever. So for this case, we'll just call it uh, day one. Yeah. So you're breaking sync. it down kind of a similar yeah. folder structure to what your audio files and your yeah. video files are. Something that and, makes sense and is clear. Yeah. 
and I might, and so I would probably either like create like a new sync folder to put this in separately. Um, but just for now, I'm just going to do this. And so then what I'm going to do is this is, uh, we'll start with just one camera first. So, so not every project is going to be multicam, but in this case, this film was multicam. So I'm going to give you two examples of how we're going to do this. Um, but I'm going to take this footage, I'm going to copy it, and then I'm going to paste it into my synced folder. And then I'm also CJ going to... CJ's coming through with the jokes. Would you say this is a uh, sync or swim moment? Uh-oh. We're getting punny here. <laughs> uh, so then I'm going to take these guys, and I think I should, should just be able to copy and paste these in as well, I think. Um, actually, you know what, I'm just going to make it easier for myself. And... Let's just open this up over here. And uh, once you're done there, Slab did have a question of wanted to ask, how exactly do you copy Lumetri from one clip to another the way you just did? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the way I would do it is let me get out of this sync folder. We'll go back down in here. Now, I've already done it. So it's kind of I'll just give you I'll just mime how I did it. But uh if you go, if you open up a clip here, I'm getting a little bit of lag right now. Sorry. Yeah. Um, a lot of things happening. Yeah. <laughs> and I would color, screen, yeah. I would copy that Lumetri color option in my effects controls, copy that, you know, and mm -hmm. then I would select all of that footage and then paste it. And I think maybe if I just go ahead and paste it, it might show up twice. So if I click on one of these, see now it's like double the color. Yeah. So I've got two different. So that's it. It's basically just copy the option and then paste it. So awesome. Rid, Thanks for touching on that. that. Yeah. Um, okay. So back to the sync. I'm just going to do a single camera real quick. And we're going to take the stuff and copy it. Now, in this case, this footage is not labeled by like, you know, what scene it, or the, the audio isn't labeled by what scene it is. Mm -hmm. So what I would usually do is I would take all of this stuff and copy all of that. This day of footage was all multicam. So all of the footage should work in the same way. So copy all that. And then this is the last uh, folder of audio. Just copy that. How many uh, how many days of footage are, are typical for something like this? Or, uh, so with a lot say. of indie features that I work on are somewhere between 15 to 20 days. Um, but then obviously, you know, bigger budget stuff can go even longer. It can go for months. So there's a lot more organization that goes into that stuff. And that's definitely where having one to two assistants is super helpful. <laughs> yeah. Somebody, somebody to keep track of all that stuff so that way you don't have to. And then all you have to worry about is the actual cutting and and uh, getting the job done. Makes sense. So, uh, man, I'm loving all the content you're you're giving us and just the way you work on things. We have about uh, 50 minutes or so left. And right now um, we've kind of touched on how to structure your project folders and just structure your, your footage in general. We've covered proxies already. And now we are working on doing a multicam. Uh, is it multicam sync or are we just syncing we're gonna, audio right now? We're going to do a regular sync first and then we're going to okay. do a multicam sync. So, Perfect. okay. And I'm just about there. So actually, let me stretch this out so that way you guys can see this a little bit better. Okay. So these yeah, actually do yeah. kind of work hand in hand, but I'll just do the, do the regular one first. Um, so everything I've got, everything from my A cam is in the sync folder. So treating this as if this is a single cam shoot. So I've got all my footage. I got all my audio. And oops. we got lots of clips here. Yeah. Which I'm, I'm sure is uh, normal for your work. A lot of footage. Yeah. A lot so of we're going to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to go create multicam source sequence. And then this is going to actually, 
it's going to sync everything up by its own time code. And I'm not going to mess with it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. sorry, on that selection process before you hit that, did you just, you selected all the audio and the video there? Yeah, everything that's in that one folder is selected. Perfect. And then I and then I just right clicked and then create multicam source sequence. And then I'm gonna hit okay. I'm not gonna do any uh any other app, any other settings there. Um, but it's gonna run and it'll tell you if there were a couple things that like didn't sync up right, and then that you would mm -hmm. go in and double check all that stuff. But uh Okay, but you just leave all these settings pretty standard. Yeah, pretty like much. The, yeah, the as, long, as long as we know that it's syncing up by time code, um, and yeah, excellent. Let us know if you have also worked with uh, this multicam sequence, or if this is new for you, and if there's any questions in the process thus far. If you're following along, uh, let us know, and we will try to touch on that. How we doing here? Of course, it's taking a second. Any, <laughs> it's a lot any questions I can here. field while it's doing this? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see. You kind of started in music. I'm also noticing um, some Ghostbusters stuff in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you a big Ghostbusters fan? Big. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The, you can't see the whole uh, other side of the room right here is all of my Ghostbusters collection. I have a minimal amount of it here on the camera side of things but yeah i call my my editing office the ghost cave <laughs> love it love it so and oh, go ahead oh okay sorry uh so the uh the clips have all finished now and so they're all grouped and organized and um so when i go let me grab one of the later ones that i know have have a couple different clips on it or a couple different audio tracks on it so we'll drag that onto there and i'd be curious too um you know going to sundance is a is a pretty big deal and you've done it multiple times uh what would be your advice for just getting it whether it's sundance um you know big picture or just the film festival circuit if that's your goal what um what's that like and how has it changed i think you said you've been doing this 10 years now and i i know the process has probably changed a bit can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, uh, a lot of times it's just, it's like a gamble, right? You, there's no guarantee to any of it. So when you're submitting films to film festivals, you you really just, you're putting out the money and uh, trying to, there's a lot of networking involved as well to make sure that like your project is getting in front of the right people or the right programmers. Um, but uh that uh it's you just never know which ones are going to hit which ones aren't i've had a lot of really really great films that haven't gotten any of the prestige film festivals but then um i've had some that i wasn't thinking you know i wasn't sure about or you know wasn't really expecting to go and like those have been the ones that got in so um it's it's really just a mixed bag or certain film certain films that you think are going to go to a certain festival that do not and it goes to a different <laughs> festival that you didn't think it was a good fit for there's it's all kinds of stuff like that um yeah so so with my clips created now i've got uh, all of my tracks are in here and it's all in sync and it's all ready to go so that's great now i need to do the exact same thing but i need to do it with a multi-cam <laughs> so uh just to give you guys the example real quick i'm going to undo what i just did and make sure, did that actually go through, undo. Wonder if it's doing them one at a time. Oh yeah. Oh, there it goes. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> Would you say this is uh, one of the most underappreciated parts of editing a feature film that is maybe overlooked? The organization side of it? Yeah. And just creating <laughs> the proxies, getting everything synced, you know, the stuff that people think is, you know, it comes out of camera this way. Yeah, right. 
Um, yeah, I think definitely there's a lot of uh, the organization side of it is for sure. Uh, maybe it is uh, for sure. I think, uh, you know, you don't think about it when you're at the movie theater and you're like, oh, wow, that movie. Stinked <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, you know, it's like <laughs> or, you know, if you could imagine like going to see something like an Oppenheimer and like all the so prep good. work and and you know the the time it took to shoot that and all of that stuff that uh, that comes with it so that uh that is I just watched that film uh what is it probably about a month ago now and man I loved it so good so now so now what I'm doing is the, before I just took my A camera and did a, just a single sync with it. Now I'm going to do a multi-cam. So I have my A camera and my B camera. And I'm going to do uh, the same thing. And uh, hopefully it doesn't take 30 minutes like this last one did. Uh, I tested it out earlier and it went really quickly. So okay. <laughs> great, great multi-cam sequence. Same thing. I'm doing it by time code. Sequence preset automatic. All of that stuff. And so it's going to run. Uh, is there another question I can answer real quick while this is happening? Yeah. Uh, anyone feel free to drop any questions into the chat there. Um, and I will do my best to funnel those over. Uh, if there is one project for people to kind of check out, I guess on your website is probably the best place. Um, is there a particular one that you're, uh, more proud of than, than another? Oh yeah. I'm proud of all of them. Um, I think that like the, the ones that I get the most attention are, uh, is a film called Scare Me that was at Sundance in 2020 and uh, streaming on Shutter and uh, it's available elsewhere too like Apple movies and uh, uh, Amazon Prime Video and uh, and then um, and then I've got a few other ones that uh, came out in the last few years one called Blood Relatives that's really fun and another one called Who Invited Them and then I've got a feature coming out hopefully this year called Shelby Oaks directed by Chris mm -hmm. Stuckman that I'm really, really excited about as well. Um, but yeah, if you go to my website, uh, it's patricklawrence.com with all the vowels removed. Uh, you can see a lot of the stuff that I've worked on and uh, you know, or check out my IMDB. Uh, <laughs> that will give you a good <laughs> idea as well. Um, okay. So now we've got all of the uh, multicam clips are ready to go. And so I am going to now create a scene bin. And I know that this is actually scene seven. So I'm gonna open that up and I'm gonna move it over here for right now. And in here, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna select all of these multi-cam clips. Um, one of the questions coming from YouTube is for the amount of times that you see a scene and as you're editing, uh, do you have any tips or how do you try to see it as a first timer that maybe hasn't seen the scene, like as you're editing, any tips for that? Does that make sense? Yeah. A lot of times I like to put myself in the audience's shoes and if I, you know, you read a script in advance and then they shoot it and it's not always the way it's supposed to be <laughs> and so it's so i've had my heart broken a couple times when you like read a script and you're like oh my god that's going to be amazing i can't wait to see it and then you get the footage and it's like oh so um it's that goes good. into those other elements of life that you need for editing of just how to take that feedback and yeah <laughs> it's not quite what you thought so so it definitely is a good uh a bit of like um you know limiting your expectations a little bit but then also like learning to think the way the audience would like if i'm going into it and i don't i don't uh like i don't uh under if i if i don't understand something that's happening in the scene or i don't understand a character's motivation um things like that it's like if it bumps for me then it's probably going to bump for the audience right mm, so yeah. that's the way i like to look at it um yeah, okay that's great okay so uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring this back over here. So I have a scene bin now with all of my footage in the scene bin and I am going to go through and then label these, right? So this would be like, uh, this would be one take a one, 
and then this is probably one Tato two, and then etc. Actually, this is scene seven, mm. not scene one. Okay. Sorry. So, scene seven, Tago one. Scene seven, Tago two. So each each different one here is broken down by scene, individually yeah. synced. So Love this it. would be like lots of multicam. Seven Tago three. Uh, do you have any any tips or things you would tell someone who's just starting out or thinking about going into the field that you're working in? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the big thing, like I mentioned earlier, would be learning as many platforms as you can. Learning, you know, whether it's Avid or it's mm. Resolve or Premiere, you know, learn the entire Adobe Creative Cloud suite, all of those things. It's important because you just never know what job you're going to walk, walk on and they're going to be like, oh, hey, do you know how to do this? And you don't, then that's a bit of an issue. So, um, you know, they're going to go to the person who can do that. So it's good to be familiarize yourself with all of that stuff. And then, yeah, I mean, it's important to go and you know, make those connections, network with people, make your intentions known. You know, I always tell people, it's like, if you can get on a set and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, I was, um, the first film I had get the Sundance was a short film called affections and my roommate shot it. And he asked me if I could come out and help on set. And I, you know, I didn't have anything going on. So I said, yeah, absolutely. I'll come out and do it. And so that weekend for two days, we shot this beautiful short film and I had a lot of fun and, and I, and I, uh, met the director and, you know, we were like, okay, uh, at the end of it, I gave her, I gave the producer my business card and said, you know, I'm actually an editor. It's what I actually do here. <laughs> um, so, uh, if you need somebody to edit this, let me know. And, you know, they already had somebody in mind. So, I didn't hear from them for a couple months and then they weren't happy with the cut. So they reached out and asked me if I would do a version of it. So they were gunning for a Sundance deadline and I did and they loved it. And I, I, I did the cut pretty quickly, kind of in less than a week, uh, recut the whole thing and they loved it. And uh, a couple months later it got in the Sundance and really it's like every job that was in 2016 and every job I've done since then, I can somehow trace back to me giving the producer my card that day. Mm. So you really so don't networking know. networking is a big part. Networking and, you know, I, I don't like to advocate for, um, you know, free work, but if it's something where you're uh, comfortable with and your bank account is comfortable with it, and you can work for free on something just to make some connections. I would do it because, yeah, you just never know who you're going to meet and yeah. uh, where that's going to take you, you know? Yeah, that's an excellent answer. And I think it, it definitely resonates with me as well. I even started using kind of those digital business cards on your phone. Um, even yeah, that's last that, time at Adobe Max. And it's those are great. Yeah, I actually that's funny. I, I actually got. Uh, I actually learned from one of the Adobe reps, uh, how to do that. And I've been using it, you know, with like a QR code Yep. Uh, <laughs> and it's pretty great. Um, okay. So real quick, I'm not going to do this whole thing cause it's going to take forever, but yeah, yeah. I think um, we can, uh, get the idea from just a couple of them. So we got probably yeah. maybe a little under, uh, I don't know. We got 45 minutes or so before we need to recap. Yeah. Actually so, no, a little less than that. So. So we've got, so uh, I've got a bunch of clips here in my bin. We're going to call this my scene seven bin. Um, and I've got them all in here. And then um, they're synced, they're colored, they're multicammed. Uh, and I know I kind of sped over the multicam part, but here you go on the screen. You can see yep. that it was synced and it's ready to go. And um, now what I want to do is I want to organize my scene bin. And this is something that I love because it was a couple of years ago that, uh, that uh, Premiere introduced the freeform view. And I love it so much because it sort of mimics the same folder structure that I would do if I was using Avid. But 
I bring my clips in here and I've got thumbnails for everything. And so, you know, like right now it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a mess. Things are kind of everywhere. But uh, what I do is I like to just group them together. So this is always a thing that takes a couple minutes, but mm, like okay. take all these and just group all them together. And I got seven, seven A, seven B, there's, you know, seven five. So, you know, seven, I love three. seeing uh, people's different workflows and kind of this using this view as well and moving things around. Yeah. I know yeah. Um, on YouTube, Roland was also asking or more commenting on like, do you use color labels as you're doing this sort of stuff? Sometimes. Um, yeah. It, it, it depends yeah. on um, like I, anything that's like red is like a thing where I'm like, Ooh, okay. Then I've already used that or, you know, <laughs> yeah. but I like my, my color labels are mostly either uh, like Caribbean green is like one I use a lot. And then, um, red being something that uh you know either i'm not going to use or sometimes i use violet just because like purple is my favorite color so i like to use that a lot um but uh yeah that's kind of the extent of what i do with it okay oh i see what you're doing here yeah awesome. so i grouped i grouped them together by their angle um, this is two, this is B, D1, C1, seven. This is four. awesome to see. And my, my line of work's a little bit different. So I typically don't have that many structured takes. I don't do feature film type yeah. stuff. Um, so for me, I mean, I've been an editor as well for over a decade now, and it's really cool to see this kind of different workflow and just even visually see how you're organizing it by angle mixed with yeah. take well, and all that sort of stuff. I love that. So once I've got them all grouped and it's all really sloppy, then usually I just lasso them all and then align the grid and it'll clean it up. And mm -hmm. that's it. So I would do this with all of my angles. Um, the nut, the way they slated this scene in particular is kind of funky, but I've tried to give you guys the best example of like how I do it. So I've got like, you know, this is seven, take one through five. So that's an angle, seven A, seven B, and then there's A7, A7B, B7C, you know, so they, they were kind of all over the place with the way they slated it. But yeah. like I grouped them all together. So that way I sort of know like which ones are my similar angles. And so I know it's like, okay, if, if take one didn't work, let's go to take two or take three. Um, and, and so that's what I do there. And then the next thing that I do is I create a string out or sometimes it's called a chem roll. But what I do is I uh, create a new sequence and you go in, I do just custom 23.98 and this is 1920 by 1080. Um, you change any other, any things you want to do. And then, you know, I call this scene seven chem roll. And then I take that and I kind of keep that off to the side. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a string out of all the footage from that scene mm -hmm. and then i'm bringing it into my timeline here and i'll say uh yeah actually i should probably do change sequence so that way it matches um so now oops sorry i screwed that up that's <laughs> okay the options of windows we have here would yeah. you say there's uh any ai tools that you would like to see in the future to kind of speed this process up or that maybe you already use um i don't know if you use you know the text transcription or text-based editing for certain scenes um it might be a scene by scene basis uh yeah so this is this is exactly where i'm going with this is that so okay, once i've <laughs> once i've got my footage all into a string out or a chem roll this is where i usually watch down the dailies for each scene so before I cut a scene, the very first thing I do is I watch it down. So in this case, I've got like 40 minutes of footage here. So mm -hmm. I just bake that into a part of my day that I'm like, okay, if I'm trying to aim to get three scenes cut today, then I have to spend a significant amount of time watching down all of the footage first. And then if I go, you know, if I go through and I watch stuff and I like, then I might like, um, I might make a cut. You know, I might say like, oh, you know, I actually really like this part. 
and then grab that and like lift it up so that way i know that like that's a thing that i like it's just you know other people might do they might drop like a note or a marker on um specifically i'm gonna do that like you know if i make a like this part you know i'm like i'm gonna add a marker and then i'm gonna drag it out and say like oh i like uh like a great line read or something and then let's say i'll drag it out so that way i can see it okay Okay, make your notes there. Yeah, so I might do stuff like that as I'm going through and I'm watching it all down. But then the big thing that has changed my workflow over the last year has been the inclusion of text-based editing. And, you know, text-based editing, I think, was more developed for sort of like the doc world or like, you know, promo work or behind the scenes work or whatever. Um, it's really great for when you're doing some kind of like talking head interview uh, you can really just get in and not only find audio faster, but you can also, uh, you can also, you know, edit in real time. Right. And, uh, I've had a lot of fun doing that on some doc work this past year. Uh, I've used but, it a lot to kind of find those keywords you might be looking for too, or just sift yeah. through what do we got here? Uh, almost 40 minutes of footage. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and of course, my world, it's not even right. popping. Not Hello popping to up. Michael in the chat. Uh, to answer your question, Michael, uh, these are archived, so they will be on YouTube as well as Behance. So if you missed the beginning, don't worry. You can pause, replay, rewind. You can watch it from the start. We're hanging out here with Patrick, and he is a feature film editor. Uh, he's been in the festival circuit. He's been on Netflix, been to Sundance, and he's showing us his workflow for feature films, including so far we've talked about uh, how to name your bins, how to bring the footage in, creating proxies, uh, syncing things, syncing your audio, making multi-camera sequences. And uh, yeah, it's been great. We've been hanging out here for an hour already, which means we have <laughs> we have about 20 minutes left before we need to recap. And I know we have tons of content we can get through, so we might have to have you back again because lots of questions coming through. But uh, what do you have left for us in this 20 minutes that we want to kind of hammer? Yeah, the big thing on? I wanted to show is this text-based editing thing. And of course, it is uh, not cooperating with me right now. It's not showing up. But um, the the great thing about it, and especially when you're, when you're uh, deep in the process, you're working with a director and you've already got the scene cut. And somebody might be asking for a specific line reading or something. Um, you know, uh, that, uh, oh, we need to find like a different, we need to find like a different, uh, reading of that or whatever. So that's what I would go in to my chem roll here with everything sort of grouped and organized. And I would use my text-based editing panel that is not showing up currently, uh, as, uh, how I would, uh, go in and find that stuff. So, um, yeah uh what i would do i'll show you this is sort of the, this is the finished scene so mm -hmm. you can see all the dialogue is like here highlighted in the scene so i would just basically you know look for uh i would look for like a line like uh like specifically i know like 500 dollars pops up you know and so it would tell me right here like oh here's 500 there's there the line goes. Yeah. yeah. And so what I would do in my chem roll would be the same thing as like every time that line 500 would pop up here, it would show up and then tell me, uh, tell me like how many times it was said. And then I would go in and find that and then, uh, and then, uh, uh, pull that out. Um, if this, I'll skip over this for now. And then if, and then if we have time, I'll open up another project where I know it's working properly. And, okay. Yeah, uh, I will show that. But that's that's a bit of a bummer because that's the one thing I really, really, really wanted to show. Uh, and it's kind of uh, acting goofy right now. Yeah, it's always tough when you're like live streaming as well and then trying to run an editing program with a, with a bunch <laughs> of multicam clips. Yeah. So once uh, so the other thing that I do is uh, once I've got everything that I like going on here, uh, I will in my scene bin. 
uh, let me open that back up again. So I got my scene bin. It's all organized and everything here. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times I'll float this and I'll float it over to my other screen that you guys can't see. But uh, when I'm ready to start cutting, I'll take this and then I'll duplicate it. And then I'm going to rename it and just call it like scene seven because that's the one I'm working on. And then I would open that up. And then the real fun thing is to do sort of like a pancake editing technique uh, that I love. Ooh, and breakfast. Yes. And so I've got my chem roll up top and then down here at the bottom. So what I could do is I could go in and anything that I liked, I would cut that out, you know, and then delete everything else so I could start fresh. Or I could just take everything and then start fresh and go in and then same thing. Take all the things that I did like over here. So, for instance, I was like, OK, yeah, like I like uh, this line reading from here to here, let's say. Yep. <clears throat> yeah and i like your use uh i do the same thing with the kind of stacked double sequences yeah just drag it down to you know it automatically copies it over yeah grab what you like drag it down start cutting your scene together so now once i've done that i would do all that stuff with all of my edits and then i would have a finished scene And I it's forget over. what what you said. Is this uh, this movie already out? Like no, at this the is... end of all this? Okay. No. no when yeah, when yeah. are people going to be able to see this? I I think hopefully this this will probably be out sometime this year. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. So uh, now this is a uh, this is like stuck or something. Uh, I'm gonna. And thanks so much, uh, Roland, Traps, Slav, Jack for our moderator, and Michael, everyone for um, just commenting and participating in the Adobe Live chats. This is what makes this so much fun. Uh, as we do get closer to wrapping up, we probably have another uh, 15 minutes before we kind of do a recap. Oh, if there's great. any um, questions along the way, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, feel free to throw those in. Um, if you've been following along and maybe you missed a step or anything like that or have a question, throw it in the chat. And uh, on top of that, if you love talking with Patrick and you love hearing these creator perspectives and you love listening to it, uh, Teresa Ao from Adobe uh, is having conversations with lots of people uh, like Patrick and people that are in the industry. And there is a podcast that can be found on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and it's called In the Making. Go check it out. It's awesome. Really great stuff. Yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm closing the other uh, demo project because I'm done explaining all of that stuff. So I'm going to kick it over to this side. And uh, All right. Hopping uh, over. Yeah. Although for some reason this one's stuck on just this, <laughs> this <laughs> it's thing. still loading, huh? Uh, yeah. Um, but anyway, this is a, the completed scene after I'm done doing all that stuff. And I, you know, uh, I've showed you guys basically how to organize it, how to keep it in the bins, uh, naming your files, you know, doing it by scene. And then once the scene's cut in the multicam, uh, this is what it would look like. And, uh, uh, well, now it's just like, I'm just not getting anything right now. On uh, YouTube, Vigil is asking if you've uh, worked on any full solo projects. And I would imagine uh, by that, it's meant like any feature films solo. Solo? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, most of them have been solo. Um, I very rarely get to work with other editors. Uh, so it's it's been, yeah, it's been mostly just me uh, by myself in a cave <laughs> working on <laughs> working on some of these projects uh that's it's definitely definitely you, the case do you shoot as well or are you you're in editing world only uh no i used to i used to do a lot of directing um but uh yeah it uh uh over the years it has gotten uh, a bit more focused on the editing side of things 
Um, mm-hmm. But from time to time, like I do occasionally like direct a music video or uh, I will, uh, I did, I directed funny enough, a Ghostbusters fan film a couple years ago. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, I got to uh, not only direct once again, but also do, you know, an homage to my favorite film of all time. So that was cool. And I also said it was like, if I never direct again after that, I'd be perfectly <laughs> you, fine you're with, done with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm restarting real quick because it seemed like it was caught up on something. No problem at all. So uh, for anyone who is kind of just tuning in or is maybe at work today and kind of listening in the background, this will be available on YouTube and Behance as our moderators have posted. And um, yeah, we've been hanging out with Patrick here. And uh, Patrick, are you on on the socials? Oh, yeah. Same thing as my website. It's Patrick Lawrence with all the vowels removed. So P-T-R-C-K-L-W-R-N-C-E. I saved the E because it just looks funny without it. All right. I like it. <laughs> straight, straight into the point. Um, let's see here. So what do you have? So you're working on this right now. What do you have um, coming up in the future that you are excited about? Or do you have any other um, kind of goals that you would like to achieve this year in the editing realm? Uh, I'd like to see uh, a lot of work come back and everybody be able to uh, work and thrive and live in this industry <laughs> once again. <laughs> um, it's been a very tough uh, last year and then a tough couple of years since the pandemic. But um, I'm hoping that maybe this year won't be a repeat of last year, but we'll see. Um, I've been really lucky and blessed to work on a couple of good projects, but um the work is pretty scarce out here right now as anybody working will tell you so <laughs> oh no yeah all right so is this just a massive project yeah uh, yeah no it should oh, it's it, going very slowly yeah it's going it, sh- it shouldn't be um yeah the last the last couple of things i wanted to show real quick is like when you're done and then uploading to frame io and then uh working from there uh and yeah, can you, what's your process? I mean, we can just talk through it while we're waiting on this. But, yeah, absolutely. So uh, what's, what what's is the... Frame.io and how do you go about, um, you know, taking that feedback and implementing it? Like in, in your work, what is some of that feedback like? So oh, Frame is, uh, Frame is uh, a lot of fun because it, uh, when it first came out, it was just kind of like a new, we were used to like uploading everything to like Vimeo or something for like reviews. Um, and it has since become like a really cool place where you can not only just like upload your cuts and share them, but also people leave comments directly on it. And then once it became integrated with Premiere, um, it became even easier to do those things because when you're sent out a cut and then you get something like, you know, I don't know, 92 notes on something, (laughs) um, uh i restarted premiere it's it's loading faster now um so uh once uh once it became very easy to go in and upload a cut directly like i i don't even half the time i don't even bother exporting through media composer or, or sorry not media composer, uh, uh media Enco- uh media encoder uh i will just do an active sequence upload Mm-hmm. directly from my timeline and go straight to frame uh so it's great so in this case like this is the finished scene that we were just uh talking about and what i can do is i think i probably flattened it yeah um what i could do is once it's done set my out point and then i come up here to uh frame and I go upload active sequence. And then I do all my settings. I have like a setting with time code. So the time code's baked in. Mm-hmm. And I set my export ver- my export folder. And then I also check like keep the rendered file and also auto version. Because sometimes if you're working on multiple versions of something, you might upload it in the same day. And then frame gives you the ability to then uh, go back and double check the previous versions, which is great. So once I do this, if I hit upload, it'll send it to media encoder and then media encoder will automatically upload 
that to frame, which shows up here. And then what's great, what I love about it is that if people are watching it and they're leaving notes, you know, they can come in here and they can say like, uh, great entrance. And then they could come over here and then go like, oh, let's find a different, so let's find a different <laughs> read for this line. Or they could be like, uh, it could be like, oh, this reveal is so funny. Great job. Um, right and they would be typing this most likely kind of yeah. on the web browser you could yeah you could see my my here. face okay. and my name pop up here and all these because i'm the one who's doing it but yeah if you when you send the link out uh when you share it they will have the ability to do all of these things and they can leave these notes and then once they're done i can come in here directly into uh the frame io panel which is uh available here review with frame io and I can click on the comments tab and it'll show all the different comments that I left. And if I click on this download button right here, I can import the comments directly into the timeline. And so here they are. I can go. I can also see them in my I love marker that window. They're right here. But I can go directly to them and boom, there they are. And I can read all the comments. This is funny. Great job. Best editor ever. You know, all that. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And then I even take that one step further sometimes as I go through and start addressing notes. Um, I like to label them like green, red, or orange. Like if it's kind of like a eh, in progress or we, this might take some more time or like, you know, red, it still needs to be done or green's done that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I yeah. I love here. the, uh, the options to, um, to uh, when you sort them and it's like your your status labels and all that stuff and um, but yeah so uh, to kind of wrap up the whole thing uh, this is sort of the this is a completed project or the whole the whole film is done I'll attempt to uh, open up the uh, you know the, I've got seven reels of footage here and I break reels into about fifteen to twenty minute segments of the film. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so the film is an hour and 40 minutes. So I break it into like 15 minute chunks, which is why I have seven. Interesting. Okay. And so when it's done, a lot of people were asking about how do you do turnover for sound and color? Or how do you, how do you deliver for those things? So typically what happens is you get a document from whoever your post house is, whether it's sound or it's color, and they will uh, tell you exactly what their needs are, <laughs> whether it's like an XML or an AAF. Um, do they want a long play? Do they want to film in reels? And a long play is like the full cut of the film. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, we're working in reels. And if I open up a reel, and I'm a make this a little bit bigger here so you can see it and as you're doing that uh traps on youtube you're asking if frame io is free with a creative cloud subscription uh yes there is a free version that allows a certain amount of space i forget exactly what it is maybe 100 gigs um, but i use it all the time it's great been using it for many years now absolutely love it if you haven't used it take advantage of it it's powerful Okay, so this is my real one. And I've got all of my footage is down here on a lower level. All of these other tracks are like my visual effects. And then I've got a mask and I've got a watermark and I've got other kind of like on-screen markers that are meant to like tell people things. Um, and then I also have my tracks are grouped by dialogue. So I've got my first 10 tracks are all dialogue tracks and then Tracks 11 through 15 are all sound effects tracks. And then 16 through 18 <coughs> are all music tracks. And so I color coordinate those as well. So I know what's what, and I keep them separate because you, you might see, I mean, the worst thing to do is to turn over stuff to especially sound and have files all over the place. It's, it, it's awful. So you want to try to keep your stuff organized. So that way, when you do send it to them, 
that like they're all encapsulated in the right tracks and that they know what's what. Um, and so when I do that, uh, I'll try to give you guys the short version of this, but um, you want to uh, take what I do is whatever my locked version is, I take it and I duplicate it. So for color, I'll duplicate it and I will delete all of the audio tracks. Mm -hmm. And then I have my complete timeline here exactly the way it is with all of the important stuff that they need to export. And then I also have an adjustment layer here that has uh, data burn in that says what the clip is and what the time code within the clip is. And so I will then go, if your uh, color house is doing the online, what I would do is send a Final Cut Pro XML and then it'll just ask you where to drop it. This one's pretty, XML is pretty standard. You just mm -hmm. basically hit export and it does it. And you send them that file along with a reference video with this stuff burned in. So that way they know what clip is what and what the time code is. And it helps them just online it. <clears throat> and then you would do that. Or sometimes they ask for like long play versions or they ask for just ProRes versions, in which case what you would do is go back to your original footage um, by toggling the proxies back on. So your raw files would be back on. And then you would export a QuickTime ProRes file for them in a long play version or in the reels. Um, and then also provide them with an EDL of the footage so that they know yep. where all the cuts are. <clears throat> And then on so the you're sound, making that yeah that reference and then <coughs> sending sending the file to go along with it so yeah. they can reference and color and then uh for sound you got everything kind of broken out really clean not messy i love the color yeah. labeling i do the same thing so yeah on the sound side of things i do the i do the exact opposite i duplicate it i delete all the video layers and then i have all of my sound independent and then what i would the other thing that i think is really important is you basically turn all your tracks back on so you can mute a couple tracks um these here are muted because i don't need them anything that's mm -hmm. muted doesn't come through in the aaf so <clears throat> turning everything back on so that they have all of the files available some people cut with mixed tracks i like to cut with all of the tracks just because i like to have options and i like to be able to turn things off and on as i cut again that is just uh editor's preference so uh it's not you know you can do it either way you want to this is how i do it and like i said i do 10 tracks and so what i do is go in and do an aaf sometimes i ask for an omf a lot of times i just do AFs. <clears throat> and then you do sample rate 4800 and then 48,000, and then uh 24 bits per and then embed the audio within the AAF and then you usually give them anywhere from like 500 to a thousand frame of handles. So that way, if they have to move the audio, they can, they have a little bit of freedom there with it embedded in. <clears throat> um, a lot of times sound houses will also ask for you to send the production audio as well. So that way they just have it. So that's good to know, but like uh, you encapsulate everything in the AAF and then when they open it up, it's all there with all the information and it's all populates into their timeline, which is great. Um, <clears throat> and then the other thing that I do is I make wave reference stems for everybody. <clears throat> so uh, usually what I'll do is once I've got everything organized, I go in like I'll lasso everything and like delete and then I'll hit... <clears throat> waveform audio just make a kind of waveform bit. yeah for and then each make category yeah. exactly exactly so yeah. i i do that i call that dialogue and then i would go in and i would take all these and all of the video or the uh, music tracks delete those and i would export that and call that sound effects yeah that makes good and sense and then i would take all of these again and delete that export call that music perfect yeah um, that's a, a great workflow and unfortunately we are about out of time um thank you so much for everyone who has joined in on the chat and patrick wow we have a lot of 
just knowledge and just awesome workflow going on here uh, that resonates with me as well. I would love to, um, you know, if Adobe people here are listening, which they might be, I'd love to get you back on here and, and go even more in depth with how you break this all down at another time. But uh, I've had a lot of fun hanging out with you here today. Um, could you give us, well, actually, I'll do a quick recap here because we're almost out of time. But um, we have gone through organizational process for creating folders, uh, bringing that information, or, sorry, not information, bringing that content into Premiere into those same type of structured folders, as well as making proxies, syncing uh, your cameras, syncing your mm -hmm. audio. We've talked about frame IO. Uh, we've talked about kind of how you go through and kind of select things and make comments. And we've talked about, we touched briefly on exports and all the different exports you need to make, uh, whether it's, you know, for color, for sound, how to do stems for different, um, audio tracks for your music and everything. What did I miss anything, Patrick, that we covered a lot. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, for everyone hanging out here be sure to check out the replay on adobe behance and on youtube uh if we can get maybe another post for how to follow patrick uh that would be great to our moderators and uh thanks everyone for joining in coming up next we do have the adobe partnership team members discuss tiktok videos within premiere uh their workflow will cover how to create edit caption within premiere using keywords, hashtags, and getting that all exported directly from Premiere to TikTok and even TikTok drafts. So I had a great time. Thank you so much, Patrick, for being here. Um, thank you for I think having that's me. That's all we got. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, we'll see you next time.